and uh, good afternoon and good evening to all the participants who have joined this program on forecast scheduling fad or fundamental so before we quickly start on this program okay so i wish a warm welcome and a happy independence day to each one of you so before we move on to the agenda of this program a quick overview about what project management institute does and what are the different standards and the membership and the impact it creates across the world so we have around uh, 20000 members pma members in india and around uh, 425000 uh, members across the world so there are around eight chapters in india so in chennai we have the pmi chennai chapter so in most of the metro cities in chennai and india we have these chapters extended so for each specialization on project management practices there are 38 virtual communities of practice through which you would be able to understand and um, maybe uh, connect with practitioners across the globe on different project management principles. So PMI is a global not-for-profit professional association which tries to promote project management across the world. So there are around 13 global standards so the recently one that is published is more on the program and the portfolio management that will help you to align the collection of projects and programs to strategic objectives. So there are around six major credentials from the Project Management Institute and we have around 565,000 credentials globally on project management. So in India we have around 30,000 plus credential holders and this number keeps on growing every day. This is just to give you a quick overview about the list of certifications available in PMI. So the most hot and favorite certification is the PMP, which all of you would have heard about. So this is ideally for project managers who would like to manage a single project which have some time and cost constraints attached to it. If you have uh, practitioners in your company who are not going to play the role of the project manager, but just going to assist the project managers in order to achieve their objectives we have a certification called CAPM which is a certificate associate in project management. The next certification is more the PGMP standing for program management for professionals. For this certification ideally you need to be managing programs for a while okay so ideally this is more for people who are taking care of a business unit or a collection of projects aligned to some strategic objectives. So in certain companies, mainly the construction or more in terms of automobile, where time and risk is predominantly important, there are certifications on PMI RMP and the scheduling professional also. So mainly in the IT industries where the requirement changes often, uh, we have a standard or a method called Agile, which some of you would have heard about. So if you are going for an Agile methodology, there is a certification called PMI for Agile Certified Professionals. So for more information about these certifications, you can visit PMI.org to know about the eligibility criteria for it. So let's get started. So this is going to be a virtual webinar. So you are used to this format. So but we are going to make a few changes in terms of the interaction style. So the last, uh, maybe the last 20 minutes or 30 minutes, we are going to have a Q&A where you would be given freedom to ask questions and where I will try to answer it. But during this program, there will be certain questions that will be asked. So please feel free to post your insights, your experiences through the Q&A window. Okay, so that we would be able to know what your insights are and we can um, change the format accordingly. So there are a few rules, make sure that you collaborate, okay, so whatever experience you have and uh, in now, uh, as of now, we have around uh, 27 people who have joined this webinar. So this number will be growing every minute. So make sure that you are using your Q&A to share your insights and um, maybe I, it does not mean I'm the expert and you are the participants. Maybe you might have a different opinion, a better opinion than me. So help others by sharing your insights and please feel free to ask your questions through the Q&A window, okay? So let's look at the agenda, okay? So this is going to be a two-hour webinar. So I'm going to focus on four aspects of scheduling, okay? And uh, predominantly, I'm going to take examples from the software industry, 
okay and that's where uh, most of the scheduling okay uh, discipline is mainly followed using the scheduling tools we are also going to uh, look at how the different tools and techniques dictated by the project management body of knowledge can be implemented when we do scheduling so the first pain area which we are going to focus on is to how to capture your promised days to your customer without killing your dynamic plan. The next pain area which we are going to talk about is how to upgrade um, your format of recording your actuals from percentage complete into uh, other techniques that will make sure your finish date of your activities and project finish date are dynamic by itself. The third pain area which we are going to talk about, so if you are going to use certain scheduling tools, there are ways to customize the scheduling tool to give you some graphical indicators that will un help you to understand where we stand with respect to your project. And finally, I'm also going to touch on how to manage agile projects using scheduling tools. Okay. So let's start with a very basic question. What is a project schedule? Okay, so I'm going to take the next one minute waiting for your answers. So participants, you can use your Q&A to post your questions for this term. What do we mean by a project schedule? Your time starts now, please. So participants use your Q&A to, to tell me what do you mean by a project schedule. We have another 30 seconds please. Very good. Thank you. Thanks to all participants. The first one who uh, gave us the response was uh, Krishna Kumar. Okay. So thank you Krishna Kumar and Vumpa. So as per their definitions, a schedule in a project is time. Uma says it's a timeline uh, in which certain activities needs to be completed. Sudhir Kumar says uh, a schedule is a time from start to end of the project. I'll just take two more. Uh, pro Top Singh says it's meeting target dates. Uh, we have uh, Nair Nanda Kumar saying the preparation of time for various tasks and monitoring against your actuals. So thank you people. So we have a very uh, a concrete definition of what a project schedule is. Now let me give you two versions of definition of a project schedule. Now let's read this question. Do you treat your project schedule as option A? A list of things to be done in a project with due dates or a list of things to be done in a project with some task relationship and estimates. So if your answer is A, go to the Q&A and type in A. If your answer is B, go to the Q&A and type in B. We'll take 20 seconds for it. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your response. So I see there is a um, good mixture of response. Some of them have said A, some of them have said B. Okay, let's try to understand what A is. So when you talk about A, we say that a schedule is a set of tasks that needs to be done with some target dates. Whereas if you look at uh, the option B, it's a list of things to be done in a project where these tasks needs to be done in a particular order okay that should be a sequence in which I we do this task and each of these tasks will ideally have some estimates so based on the relationship on the estimates or the dates are going to be calculated so the difference between A and B is as per definition A we are trying to prepare a static deterministic schedule a schedule that will not change 
where we have preparing more a to-do list, okay, where we need to complete by a date and if we don't complete it, the schedule is useless. Whereas if you look at question B here, we are trying to talk about a list of things where we need to have some relationships some, and some estimates. So these, by the second definition, we are trying to build a dynamic model because if any of your activities are getting affected, naturally the relationship will create a ripple effect across the plan. So naturally creating a dynamic model is much better than preparing a static model of your schedule. So the good news is some of you might have been preparing schedule in different tools. One of the favorite tools which people say when they are preparing a schedule is Microsoft Excel. Yes, you heard it right. It is Microsoft Office Excel. Because in Excel you try to put down the list of activities with some target dates and it's more uh, given to the management more for keeping your promises. But can you use that Excel to uh, project your real finish date or will it help you in preparing a dynamic model? The answer is no. You can't use Excel for preparing a dynamic model. So naturally apart from using some best practices you also need some assistance of scheduling tools. So the scheduling tool which we are going to use in this next one and a half hour is going to be a tool called Microsoft Project. So some of you might have heard about this tool. This is ideally a, a, a software given by Microsoft which is basically for project management and scheduling. Now let's go deeper okay, to understand the schedule more better. So let's assume that I need to travel from point A to point B. Okay? And we estimate that the traveling time from point A to point B is around 5 hours. So the 5 hours is the target okay, which we need to meet. So if you are trying to prepare a plan more as a static deterministic schedule, this is how your plan will look like. So you can't use this plan for forecasting because this map will not change. It is going to be static always. But if you want to prepare a dynamic plan, what you need is more like a GPS device. So as you start moving from point A to point B, your GPS will ideally tell you whether is there any traffic or is there a best alternate route to meet your destination. It will also be able to predict whether you will be able to meet the five hours or not. Okay? So what we are trying to build is a dynamic schedule, not a static schedule. And that is something which you need to remember first. Okay? So let's see if there are any questions from people. Okay, so participants, if you have any questions during this program, please feel free to ask those questions through the Q&A, please. Okay, so this is what we mean by a dynamic schedule. Okay, now let's move on. So when you say we are trying to build a forecast scheduling, your forecast scheduling is more an approach. Okay, using this approach, the schedule by itself will be able to accurately forecast uh, continuously, which means the maintenance effort is going to go down. And uh, you don't need to build the plan again and again when you are trying to prepare a forecast scheduling. So if you just try to look at the plan below this, you can see there are two bars for each task. The black color bar on the bottom represents, represents the target which you need to meet. Whereas the blue color bar represents your current plan. So by comparing the top and the bottom, you will know whether you can start and whether you can finish your time on all these activities and your project also. Okay, so let's move on. So if you have been preparing for PMP, you would ideally be using the project management body of knowledge. So we are going to look at some tools, techniques that has been given by the time management knowledge area of the project management body of knowledge. And you would have seen this image when you go through that knowledge area. So if you try to look at that knowledge area, in order to prepare a schedule, there are different sets of information you need to have. The first information is naturally, you need to use a scheduling method. One of the commonly used scheduling method is your critical path method, CPM. So the CPM is going to be uh, applied on a scheduling tool. So we are going to use a scheduling tool called Microsoft Project in this case. Apart from using the method on the scheduling tool, we also need to have some project information. So the project information includes the set of activities you need to do, in what order they need to be completed, 
uh, who is going to do what activities. So when you try to combine the scheduling method with the software, with the project information, you will get the scheduling model. Remember a scheduling model is, um, is ideally a, a projection of how you are going to execute this project. Who is going to do what activity? So it is going to be very dynamic by itself. So this scheduling model can be presented to the stakeholders in different formats. So you can see on the bottom there are different formats. Okay. So the first one is more like a, a list of activities with some start and finish. Whereas the second one gives you more detailed information about your plan. Whereas the third one just talks about how these activities are connected by making use of a network diagram. So whether you are trying to look at as an activity list or a bar chart or a network diagram, all of them are just a representation of the same scheduling model which we are going to build. Okay. So when you are trying to build a great schedule, okay, so there are certain attributes you need to remember. The first attribute is the schedule should always be a valid schedule, which means it should always be realistic. It should accurately forecast when you are going to start your project, when you are going to finish it, what is your revised estimate and that's what we mean by valid. The second one is a dynamic. When you say dynamic, when there is a change in your project plan, be it an estimate, be it relationship or be it a change in scope. So your schedule should be able to update itself as much as possible so that your plan is more forecastable and it is more accurate by itself. The next is we need to build a robust plan. When I say robust plan, there are certain best practices you need to follow in order to build that. So for example, when your activity is getting delayed or when you try to change the dependencies of your activities, the other activities that are dependent on it, they should automatically be impacted. So we need to follow some best practices when you are trying to build a plan. And finally, your schedule should not be uh, so complex that people can't understand what it is. Yeah, it should be forecastable, but at the same time, it should be a simplified version of how you are going to execute your project. Okay. And these are the four points you need to remember when you are trying to build a great schedule. Okay. Now let me give you a, a, a quick background about what Microsoft Project 2010 is all about. Okay. So the next two slides which I'm going to walk through, okay, is just to give you an idea about what this software is all about, so that you understand the basics before we talk about the challenges in doing scheduling. So I'm just changing my screen to project 2010 okay so I hope some of you might be using this tool okay some of you might be totally new to it okay so remember the first time when you open this tool it will look like a Excel spreadsheet okay so no wonder people are using Microsoft project like Excel but remember this is not a workbook rather this is a planning tool that will help you to track measure targets and do reporting also so first we need to get the fundamentals right. Okay, so I'm going, going back to my presentation. So we know that uh, when you save any file, it is saved in a file format like NPP, where NPP stands for Microsoft Project Project. So I want you to think Microsoft Project Project is more like a database, okay, which has some three structures within it. The first structure is called as the task. The second one is called as the resource and the third one is called as assignments. So the task table will mainly contain task related information. Okay. So maybe let's try to make it a bit interactive. So participants, please go to your Q and A and can you tell me what could be the columns of your task table? Please go to your Q and A and list down what would be the columns of your task table. We'll have another 20 seconds, please. Okay, thank you participants. Very good. So let's uh, go through one by one. 
Yeah, there was a question from Pratap Singh and Santosh. Okay, so Santosh and Pratap, I'm just parking your question. We'll take it after the slide. So let's read out the answers we have got. It is WBS, activity description, start, finish, activity names, uh, maybe um, the durations. Okay, so these are the different columns. Okay, so we are not talking about examples of tasks. We are talking about the columns, attributes of tasks. So good job people. Okay, now let's move on to resources. So can you tell me what could be the columns of your resource table? I'll give you a lead. Okay, naturally one is resource name is an attribute of resource, right? So what are the other columns of your resource table? We'll take another 10 seconds. Uh, Pinaki Datta Gupta, are you able to uh, hear my voice? Can you please confirm? Okay, fine. So we got a list of uh, points. Okay, I think it was an audio issue from his end. Okay, let's uh, read through the response we have got. Uh, we said uh, manners, material, duration, it could be calendar, skill of that particular resource, designation, responsibility, period of contract. Okay, so that's what we are trying to talk about when it comes to um, resources. Okay, uh, Jacob, are you able to hear me? Can you please... Uh, Confirm through your questions window. Okay, I, I hope that uh, they are having audio issues. What about the other participants? You are able to hear my voice clearly? Yeah, thank you people. I think it might be an audio issue from end. Okay, let's proceed. So the third one is more about assignments. An assignment is nothing but it creates a relationship between the task and the resources. So if I just go back to the few slides uh, which we talked about, okay. Um, we were talking about this term called a scheduling model, okay. So the scheduling model which we talked uh, earlier, right, is this is what we talk about as task table, resource table and your assignment table. So when you try to look at these three tables, it is having uh, around 900 columns. So though we mentioned about only 20 columns maximum, so the reality is they are having around 900 columns. So when you are trying to use a software like Microsoft Project, naturally the data in these three tables needs to be simplified for us. So there are different formats that are being used by Microsoft Project to project that data. So now I'm just going back to my um, software just to give you an idea about uh, the first term called views okay so let me turn off my highlighting okay so okay so now you are able to see uh, you look you see that your screen is divided into two parts uh, towards your left you have a set of tasks with some duration estimates start and finish towards your right Depending on how long each activity is taking, you can find a, a, a bar is being drawn with respect to its start date and its finish date on the side. So what you are currently seeing is what we call as a view. So you can observe, I hope you can observe on your um, leftmost corner, there is a name printed called Gantt chart. So Gantt chart is a view, okay, is a way of representing it. So Gantt chart mainly gives you the data more in a task list format and with bars being drawn. So I'm just going to set some dependencies. So you would have heard about this column called predecessor. So I'm just going to set some predecessors here. So please understand that I don't type in the task name. Rather, I need to enter the row ID here. So let's assume that after talking to the business users, I can prepare my requirements. After preparing, I can implement the requirements. 
similarly i can build my prototype after talking to the customers and i after i build the prototype i can deliver the product and i need to go live so for which i need implement it and i need to deliver the product so i just say 3 comma 4 in this case okay uh, i think it should be 4 3 comma 5 instead okay so i hope you guys can find that i have set some dependencies so depending on how these activities are linked you can find the start and finish date is getting calculated so you can observe on your right hand side there are arrows that are connecting all these tasks so so typically in a gantt chart view the task is more given in a bar chart format and it is more a task list so for instance if i want to see the same data in a different format you can find on your microsoft project there are different options available okay so you can find there is an option available here called network diagram remember network diagram is another view in microsoft project okay so let me select that so you can find the same set of activities is given to you more like a flow chart so you can observe after talking to the customers you start preparing and building after prepare you implement after building you deliver and finally we go live so i'm not going to too much to focus on the colors right now but the objective is to give you a idea about what microsoft project is and how this data is going to be given to you in different formats okay so are there any questions on this term please called view can you please go to the q and a and post your questions okay so there were a few questions here okay so uh, pratap singh okay what should be the minimum and the maximum duration for an activity okay we are going by there is a thumb rule uh, okay this is a question from pratap singh is the question is more about duration remember there is no restriction with respect to the software you can even have it as 1 minute okay but the recommended minimum days and maximum year is okay um i would say that you can follow this rule called 1% to 10% so i'll just uh, open my notepad to just to give you what i meant 1% to 10% rule what i mean by 1% and 10% year is each activity duration should be 1% of your project duration for example if my project duration is 3 months that is uh, 60 days okay and uh, naturally i can say that each du activity's duration should either be half a day or it should be 5 days anything more than 10 percentage or less than 1 percentage you will either be macro managing or micro managing your things so this might be the recommended format for your duration there is another one which is a question from santosh called predecessor okay uh, santosh when i say predecessor we are trying to say after what task we should start the current activity so if you look at row number 2 after talking to the customers we start preparing it so on my prepare requirements i have entered my predecessor as row number 1 okay and that's what we mean by predecessors okay so joy bossu can you please provide more details about the same so can you please elaborate your question please okay so that i can understand what your question is okay nayar nanda kumar his question was more about task mode okay so i'll give you an idea about task mode right now okay so that uh, you guys can understand it so if you look at task mode currently um, you can observe that uh, each task can have either an auto schedule as task mode or manual schedule as task mode so in my current example i have all my task as auto schedule so in a auto scheduled mode if i Uh, change the duration of any of these activities the successors of these activities or the dependent activities start and finish will get automatically adjusted so if i go to the prepare the requirements row number 2 i am revising my durations from 3 2 days to 3 days so naturally its finish date will get affected and its successor will also get affected so just closely observe this so you can observe its finish date is getting affected and the start date and the finish date of its uh, successor is also getting affected
Now I'm just going to change the task mode from auto to manual for my implementing the requirements. So when I have it as manual, remember Microsoft project will not automatically adjust the start date and finish date when its predecessor is getting affected. So I'm going back to my prepare the requirements. I'll change my duration from three days to two days back. So you will expect my implementation to start early. But observe now, it's only as prepares finish date is getting affected, whereas my implementation start and finish is not getting affected. The reason is because that activities mode is manually scheduled. So if you want to fix this problem, either change the mode to auto or you can select the current task and you can find on your task tab. Okay, we use this word called a ribbon. On the task tab, you can find there is an option called respect links. When you say respect link, the dates will get adjusted automatically. So you can find it starts only on Thursday. But the problem is not permanently solved. So if I go back to my prepare and I change it back to three days, okay, you see that the dates are not getting adjusted. And since there is an unrealistic start and finish, you get an alert like this. An alert indicating the dates are needs to be adjusted by you. So I just need to say respect links again to fix this problem. So the permanent schedule, uh, permanent option here is make sure that all your activities are auto scheduled. Okay. So uh, when it is auto scheduled, naturally you will uh, be able to make it more dynamic by itself. Okay. So I think uh, that was uh, answered. Uh, Nayar Nandakumar. Okay. Why is it? Uh, uh, it takes only five days in a week. Okay. Uh, Santosh, this is about calendars. Okay, we will talk about calendars as we run through this program. And uh, there was another question from Pratap Singh. Why some activities are shown with question mark? What does that question mark indicate? Remember, by default, whenever you add a new activity, okay, I'm just trying to add a new activity saying support. Project automatically assumes that this activity is one day activity. So there is no way to tell project that the default duration should be one day. Okay, so that is a just a default duration. This question mark is an is a information to us saying that this is a calculated value by Microsoft project. Okay, it is an estimated duration. It needs to be confirmed by the user. So if you are fine with this one day, I would recommend saying double click that particular task and you can find there is an estimated option here. Turn off estimated, naturally this question mark will disappear. So remember, this question mark will no way affect your scheduling. So it is only for your information purpose. So I hope I have answered these questions. Okay, so now, okay, so now the another question is how the subtask and sub activities on the same task can be reflected. How the subtask, sub activity under the same task can be reflected here. Okay. So you are, I think you are talking about uh, different phases of your project, how it can be broken down. So we will take those questions as we look at the different pain areas. Okay. So the first term which we talked about is called view. The second term which we need to talk about is called tables. Remember on your current Gantt chart, you see there are a set of columns being displayed, right? So remember these columns represents the start and finish and the estimates. Maybe you might want to look at the performance of these activities in terms of cost. What I have come across people using this tool is they will insert a column like a spreadsheet and they will say cost to know the cost information about the current task. So rather than adding columns, okay, I would recommend on your view tab you have an option called tables. So we have different sets of data that can be displayed on your Gantt chart. So if I say cost here, you would be able to find cost related information about the same activities. So you can see the cost specific information. For example, if I change my uh, tables to let's say work, you will be able to know the effort related information about these activities. So depending on your requirement, you might want to change to different tables for different data. Okay. Now I'm just going to take a small example saying that let's say the first activity got completed. So I'm not going to look at actuals right away. So this is just to give you an idea about what we call as filters and groups. So let's say the first activity is 100% complete. So you can observe there is a tick indicating that activity is complete and you can find 
that for that particular task you can see there is a black color bar within it indicating the task has been completed so if the number of task list is going to increase it's quite difficult to know which tasks are incomplete which are completed so on the same view tab you can find there is a filter available okay so through the filter i can say list all the incomplete task in my project plan so you can find my row number 1 is hidden the remaining task are displayed similarly i can say display all the completed task so only the completed task will be displayed so depending on your requirement you can look at the different filters available in this particular drop down another option is grouping grouping and filtering are quite different filtering hides the task that don't match that condition whereas grouping categorizes the list of activities based on some condition if i say complete and incomplete task in my grouping you can find all my completed task will be in one group and the incomplete task will be displayed in another group so remember whether you are trying to do a grouping or whether you are trying to do a filtering it will not try to reorder your task list it is just represented to us in a different format okay so i'm just going back to my slides so this is what we discussed so we talked about views we talked about tables filters and groups are there any questions participants okay fine so let's uh, i think there has been some audio issues uh i request the participants to please hold on i will check uh, with the audio team here Hello participants uh, I have informed the audio team here so people who are having audio issues they will get in touch with you over email or phone okay so we started with uh, that okay i remember there were a few questions um krishna kumar yes uh, this question, yeah this program is being uh, recorded okay so you would be able to do it and um pratap singh is how do you how do we insert a column okay that's one question and another question from anup uh, gosh um how do you compare a, a schedule with actuals okay anup we'll take this question uh, maybe later okay uh, as we look at the pain areas i'll just try to take your question okay so fine so let's take a, a question from uh, pratap singh uh, his question was more with respect to how did i insert a column so remember it's quite simple remember unlike excel when you insert a column a column does not get inserted automatically so i already told you that there are three tables in your npp called task table resource table and the assignment table and there are 900 columns in the table so as you start using this tool you might be comfortable with the purpose of different columns so if i want to know the effort of these activities you can add a column called work so you need to insert it you need to type in the field name 
you can't give your own field name here because these each column each of the 900 columns are having its own purpose and you can't use it for something else okay so i hope uh, this answers the question of pratap singh okay so let's proceed people okay so now we have talked about it i think now we are getting into the agenda okay so the first pain area we are going to talk about is how to keep your promised dates without killing your dynamic plan we all know the purpose of preparing a plan or a schedule is to understand when we are going to complete this particular project and we should also be able to forecast whether you can meet the timeline or not so it should always be dynamic so the first problem which i observe generally when they prepare a plan is people start entering the start date and finish date in the columns okay so i'm just going to go back to my project plan okay and i'm just going to reset some of the entries what i made earlier so for example uh, let's say that i am removing some of these dependencies here okay so i just removed some dependencies so what people generally do is uh, they will start entering dates so rather than setting dependencies they will start entering dates so uh, let's say that i'm just going to say we prepare the requirement should start on um let me say 19th or 21st so the moment you enter a date you get that particular activity to start on that date but the problem is when the first activity gets delayed let's say from 2 days to let's say 4 days you see it does not add any impact on the next activity so reason is because when you start entering dates in either the start or the finish project puts what we call as constraints so i hope all of you can observe on your indicators column that there is a small tool tip that appears saying this task has a start no earlier than constraint on the entered date okay so when you start entering dates please remember it puts you constraint here so whether the previous activity completes or not this activity should start on a particular date so let me also give you another idea okay so let's assume i am setting some dependencies here and after setting dependencies i enter a date i say it 21st so the moment you have a dependency and you enter date this software will give you an alert okay or give you some options available it says that moving the preparing the requirement to this particular task do you want me to remove this link or do you want to keep the link and still move it to a later date or cancel this operation let me go for the second option here so i will say move this task and also keep the dependency so you can find the dependency is still retained but this particular task is starting not on 20th but it starts only on 21st which means even if its predecessor is completing early this activity can start only on or after wednesday year so the reason is because of the constraint what you are finding here so what is constraint is what we need to first understand so let me double click that particular task where i entered the date you can find on the advanced tab you can find there's a constraint type drop down available so there are different options available here okay so for example i can say this task can start as late as possible or as soon as some people will even say it should start on a particular date i would recommend don't go for must start on or must finish on when you say must start on when your predecessor activity previous activity gets delayed also this activity should still start on a particular date so it is a hard constraint okay so let me change it to must start on on that date okay i'll say okay to it so it will automatically give you a warning saying that don't go for must start on try to go for other constraints so let me go for the third option i'm not going to change the constraint type i'll say okay now you will observe since i set an inflexible constraint that icon what you get will be in red color indicating it is a inflexible constraint now if i go to the first activity and say that this activity will take 4 days to complete which means my prepare should be delayed but since it is must start on you can find your activity is not getting pushed 
because it is having an inflexible constraint here. So one of the common problems what I observe here is people don't set dependencies. Okay, rather people start entering dates just to meet the target dates here. So some of the reasons why people enter dates is because they think that they are more intelligent than the tool and they know the start date and the finish date. Another common reason is they want that activity to start on a particular date because they have promised the customer. Okay. Another common problem is they want to create this plan as quickly as possible. That's an excuse what people give. So I would recommend the solution is rather than setting constraints, you can go for a deadline feature. So let me tell you what a deadline is first. So I'm just going to go back. Okay, I'm just going to remove the constraint here to as soon as possible. When I say as soon as possible, it means as soon as the first activity completes, the next activity can start. So you can find the dependencies are respected. So I will set some dependencies here. Let's say four. I'll say three comma five. I'll say six. Okay. So I have set some dependencies here. Okay. So after what activity, what activity should start? Now let's assume that you have a given a, a promise to the customer that your support would be completed by 1st of September, okay? But you are completing early, but that's okay. But you have a target that you need to meet. So you can double click support and you can go to the advanced tab and you have a feature called a deadline. When you say deadline, it is a target date. So I'm just going to change my target date to 1st of September, okay? So it's a non-working day. So I'll make it as a working day here, okay? I'll say, okay. I hope all of you can observe for that particular date, there is a green color indicator saying that that's a deadline. So as you start working towards your project, it might happen you revise your estimates or these activity slips. So for instance, if I try to build the prototype and it is taking another five more days, so it is seven days. So now you can find the dates are changing automatically, which means it is dynamic, but you have missed the deadline date of my support task because it falls after that. So you will get an indicator here saying that this task goes beyond its deadline date. Okay. And this is one of the ways by which you can avoid entering dates here. The second is if you are not meeting the deadline date, try to optimize the plan. What I mean by optimization is try to revalidate whether this duration is still correct or Try to find if there are alternate ways of doing this job much faster. Or in other words, you can also try to overlap these activities. Okay. Some of you might have heard about this term called fast tracking and crashing. Crashing is all about adding more people, whereas fast tracking is all about uh, overlapping activities on your project. So for instance, if I want to overlap these two activities, you will talk about this term called lead and lag. Okay. So let's take it as a question now. Uh, participants, can you please go to the Q&A and tell me uh, what is the difference between lead and lag? What is the difference between lead and lag? Yes, anyone else? What do we mean by lead and lag? If you are preparing for the PMP, you would have heard about this. Okay, fine. Let's talk. Okay. There are pretty interesting answers I've got. Uh, uh, the response I got is uh, lead is a following indicator. Lag is previous. Another response is lag is behind. Lead is ahead. Okay, so when you talk about lead and lag, we are, we are not talking about in terms of the performance of your project. 
what we are trying to talk about in lead and lag is we are trying to overlap activities or we are trying to have a wait time between activities. For example, between building and delivering, we can ideally say, for example, we can say that as you build, you can also deliver. So you might want to overlap this activity with this activity. So currently it is having a finish to start dependency. You can find once this activity finishes, the next activity starts. So I can double click my deliver the product. Okay. You can go to the predecessors tab. And currently we have a finish to start dependency. Building finishes, you deliver the product. Now if I go to the lag here, if I say two days here, if I say two days, which means between the finish and start, there is going to be two days of wait time. I hope you can see there is a two days of wait time. Uh, you can find my build finishes on Wednesday, whereas this starts on Monday because uh, Thursday and Friday is a working day and Saturday and Sunday is a holiday in this case. Now, what I mean by a lead here is the same approach rather than giving two days, I'll give minus two days, which means I want my product to be delivered two days before my build prototype finishes. So I will say OK. Now I hope you can see there is an overlap that has been created here. So by this way you are able to optimize your plan so that you can finish it before your dates. Okay. So that could be another option which you can have. The third option is we can try to uh, take a copy of your optimized plan into baseline. I remember there was a question asked by a participant saying, how do I compare my uh, current plan with my uh, target what we have? Remember, a baseline is only an indicator. Okay, It will not have any information about your effort or cost information. So what we are going to do is we are going to assume that uh, this deadline, even if we miss, it is OK. I'm just going to maybe adjust the deadline to a later date so that we Okay, so you might find that that indicator disappears here. Now let's assume that this optimized plan has been approved by the customer. So you need to take a snapshot of your current plan. So you would have observed that on my Gantt chart, we are looking at a set of columns which has duration, start, finish and the predecessors. Any change I make in the start or finish or on the duration creates an effect on the other activities in your project plan. So I can say this table which is the entry table which you are now looking at is a dynamic table. Remember a dynamic table cannot be made as a target. A target should ideally be a static version. So what we would do right now is we will take a baseline of your current plan. So you ideally do a baselining once the customer has approved this estimate and the start and the finish. So first I'm just going to change my view to a view called tracking Gantt because you would be able to understand this much better. So when you change it to tracking Gantt, you can find that uh, some tasks are in red color, some tasks are in blue color. So remember the red color activity decides your project start date and your project finish date because this is the longest path in your project. If you observe the blue colored activities, it is having some amount of float time or slack time available. So naturally this is more a non-critical path whereas this is a critical activity in your project. So once you have finalized your project finish date, you need to have a copy of this estimate. So what we would do right now is, I'll go to the project. You have a set, set baseline. So this option is going to be used to take a copy of my current estimate and preserve it somewhere else in my current file. So I'm going to do a baseline now for the entire project. I will say OK. Now you can find for all these activities, you have a target that you need to meet that is given in a black color bar and the top bars represents your current plan. So where the red indicates critical, whereas the blue indicates the non-critical activities. OK, so as you start tracking the project progress, which, will, which we will do in another few minutes, you will be able to know, you will be able to compare the top bar with the bottom bar to know whether you have started ahead or whether you are behind schedule here. So is everyone clear with uh, this demonstration? Any questions on these uh, points?
Okay, so let's see what the questions we got. Santosh Garg, okay, when deadline changes, uh, duration should automatically change as per deadline. Remember the way a Microsoft project works is, uh, deadline is only a flag, it's only an indicator, okay, it's only a target date. If you miss the target date, okay, the indicator will be displayed in the first column. It will not try to optimize a plan automatically. You need to manually optimize a plan by identifying which is the critical path, which is the non-critical path. Okay. So that was the question here. Okay. Another question which we had is uh, how to avoid, okay, is it automatically avoiding Sundays? Okay. So remember the question was about calendars here. Okay. So I hope all of you would have this question. How come Saturday and Sunday is ignored here? Because when I say two days, it takes only the working days automatically, which is Friday and Monday. Saturday and Sunday is not considered. So Microsoft Project uh, as a tool is using something called calendars internally. Remember, these calendars will help you to uh, record the working time. It will also help you to record the holidays with respect to your project. So to change the working time, you can go to the change working time option here on the project tab. So you can find we have a calendar called standard where the white colored cells indicates the working days and the grayed out cells indicates the non-working days. So for the working days, you can find it is from 8 to 12, 1 to 5, whereas the non-working days is just marked as non-working. For example, if I want to say in this current project, even Saturday is a working day. The only change you need to make here is for that particular calendar, you just need to change the work weeks. So I just go to the work weeks tab here on the bottom. You can observe there is a default work week that has been applied for all the weeks. So I will just click on details and I will say for all Saturdays, currently it is non-working. So I need to say it is a working time. So I will just say it is from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., 1 p.m. to 5 p.m., okay? So which means across all months, all years, all Saturdays will be a working day. Now, just closely observe after I have saved this, you will observe the dates will automatically change because Saturday is now a working day. I hope all of you can observe it. So you might find there is a small difference because I did the baselining without this Saturday as a work. So as per my current plan, I can complete my project much earlier compared to the baseline here. So does this answer your question? Uh, okay, so let's see whose question is next. Okay, so Krishna Kumar, I think your question was answered right now. Um, okay, Ravi's question is how do I revise this plan or how do I revise this baseline? Can we set a separate baseline for subtask? Okay. So let me undo this change, last change, what I made. Okay. Uh, for example, if I want to baseline only the new activities in your project plan. For example, after support, I'm trying to go for, uh, let's say, a post-market analysis, okay, which is uh, five days here. And I'm just going to say after row number seven, we can start it. So you can observe that I have uh, changed to my project plan with this. So for example, if I want to say, uh, I want to baseline only the selected activities, you can just select those particular tasks and you can just go back to the same set, set baseline. But before you overwrite the new task with the existing baseline, you might want to take a backup of your baseline. Remember, it's always better to take a backup because the first baseline might have 10 tasks, the next baseline might have 20 tasks. So you might want to compare baselines at a later point in time. So I will say copy the current baseline which I have, which includes only the first seven tasks into another baseline called baseline one. Remember, you can observe that there are around 11 baselines you can have in project. Though we have 11 baselines, don't conclude saying we can have 11 targets. Of the 11 baseline, only the first one baseline is the active baseline. Baseline 1 to baseline 10 is only for reference purpose. So I copy baseline to baseline for the entire project. So I have done a backup. 
Now I'm going to have only this baseline in my active. I'll say selected task. Okay. And I might want to roll up this baseline to all its previous levels. So I will say to all the summary tasks and say OK. So now you observe that your current baseline is having the baseline data for the first seven and including the eight. So if you want to compare the previous baseline and the current baselines, you have a view available in project. So I'll go to the view, more views here. You have a view here called uh, multiple baselines gap. So you can observe that there, for each task there are two lines being drawn, blue and the red one. Remember the blue color lines represents your recent baseline, whereas the red one represents your baseline one. So you can observe for the last activity, it is present only in your recent baseline, but it was not there in your old baseline. Okay, so does this answer your query? Uh, so, okay, so I think... Uh, this answers the query of uh, Ravi and uh, Nayak. Okay. How to find the critical path? Okay. Ha. Okay. So I'm just going back to my Gantt chart to just give you an idea about it. Remember, uh, you don't need to, uh, instead of saying how to identify, okay, I would recommend uh, uh, you don't need to identify the critical path because project will automatically identify it for you based on which of these activities is part of the longest path. So if you observe this complete project, there are two paths available. So the first path is going to be the one which I am moving around. So it will include, maybe if I look at my network diagram, you can see that better. So you can observe there are two paths in this uh, project. Okay, so the first path is the one, two, three, six, seven, eight. This is path one. The second path is 1, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So you can find your critical path is a set of activities that have the maximum duration. Whereas the other path is going to have a minimum duration. So the critical path is going to tell you the list of tasks that cannot be delayed in your project. So going back to my Gantt chart, your critical path will automatically needs to be highlighted in a different color. So if you want to show that in your Gantt chart, on your format, you can turn on critical task here, okay? And any activity that is not part of your critical path, you might want to know by how many days it can be delayed. So on the format, you can find there is an option below that called slack. Slack that means the number of days a task can be delayed without affecting the project finish date. So if you observe row number three, uh, implementation, this task can be delayed by another five days without affecting the project finish date. For instance, if this activity takes more than five days, for example, if I revise the duration from one day to, let's say, uh, seven days, you will observe that my project finish date will get affected. Closely observe this. Okay, I'm not changed it properly. So now you'll observe my project finish date is getting affected. But rather than, uh, changing it to seven days, if I just change it to five days, sorry, you can observe my project finish date is not getting affected because it is within the Slack available only. So if you want to know uh, the Slack of those activities, you might want to turn on Slack here. So that will tell you how much of Slack is available on those tasks. So, Rav, have I answered your query? Okay, fine. So, let's proceed. Now, let me go back to my presentation. So, this is what we had talked about. Okay, so we need to use a deadline feature Make sure that if you don't meet the deadline, optimize the plan and copy the optimized plan to the baseline schedule. Another uh, common problem I have seen is uh, how to minimize the maintenance effort of your activities. So the problem I observe is uh, sometimes we add activities where the duration is uh, maybe one month or three weeks or very long. Okay. 
So when you have an activity which is very long, it's quite difficult to track it, monitor it and uh, come up with a realistic estimate. One of the reasons why they have a very long activity is they might want to hide the buffer from the customers or they don't have time to break that activity into small pieces. So the solution here is you need to create a work breakdown structure. So a work breakdown structure will help you to understand the different levels which you need to accomplish in your project. On the lowest level of your WBS will ideally have the day-to-day -day tasks that you need to complete and what are the different milestones which you need to accomplish in your project. The second point which I highlighted earlier was the lowest level activities of your project should follow this 1% to 10% due rule of your duration estimates. So I'm just going to go back to my project plan. Okay, so just to give you an idea about how to create a work breakdown structure in your project here. Okay, so let me go back to my Q&A to see if there are any questions. Okay. Yeah, Ramakrishna, what is the difference between a deadline and a milestone? Okay, that was a good question. The next question is how to enter the percentage complete of a task. Okay. So let's take the second question from Meghna. Okay, so that's quite simple, Meghna. So if I want to say the first activity is completed, okay. So I just need to open that particular task. You can find on the general you have something called percentage complete. Remember I am not trying to answer this question on if this task is uh, taking more time than the original estimate. How do I record it? So we will try to take that in the next topic where we will look at the different options for keeping your plan up to date. So the next question what I got is how what is the difference between a milestone and a deadline? Okay. So let's assume that uh, we have a task. Uh, that after post-market analysis, we say project is completed. So remember project completed is not a task, it's not an activity, it is an important event in a project, a critical point in a project. So when you say a milestone, it should be zero duration by default. The second is I am linking this milestone by row number A, okay? so which means after my post-market analysis, my project is getting completed. So a milestone is an activity, it's another task in your project plan. What I mean by uh, a deadline is, a deadline is not associated with milestone alone. It can be associated with any of the tasks which you are seeing on your screen. So you might have promised to the customer that this go live date is on a particular date or you would have promised that the project should be completed on the 15th of September. So those deadline dates or target dates is what you record in this deadline field. Okay, so if, if all the activities in your schedule can have a deadline. Okay, but milestones are only critical points in your project plan. Okay, so let's uh, go back to the Q and day. Fine. So we have talked about. Uh, how to uh, use the deadline feature and milestone feature. So now the demonstration we are going to talk about is uh, how to use the uh, WBS. Okay. Remember if I want to say that uh, uh, this project which we are currently looking at uh, is broken down into two different phases. Okay. So I can have, um, I can insert a new task here. Let's say that we have a, a study phase and uh, we have an implementation phase. So I'm just going to insert another task here, say implementation. So I want to say the first uh, three tasks uh, should come under the study, whereas the remaining tasks should come under the implementation. So you can select those three tasks and you can create a structure. You can indent or outdent here. So you can see there is an option available on your task called indent and outdent. So I'm just going to select all these tasks. I'm going to push it to the right. So if you try to look at your project plan here, so you can find there are two different phases you have in your project. So first I would recommend that make sure that uh, you have the different phases of your project 
by just having some parent activities and have some sub activities within it. The second most important point is the, uh, the dependency should be at the lowest level. Don't try to have dependencies from uh, one phase to another phase because uh, it's quite difficult to track and your critical path will not be calculated properly. Another observation I would like to recommend is you would like to know the total duration of your project. So currently it's quite difficult to know what is the total duration of your project. We are only looking at a phase level. So when you talk about a work breakdown structure, we all know the level zero of your work breakdown structure contains your vision statement. So if I want to have the level zero to be displayed on your screen, you can go to the uh, format tab and you have an option called project summary task. So when you turn on the project summary task, it will tell you the total duration of your project, when does your project start and when does your project finish. For example, if I want to say this project is not starting today, but it is starting somewhere in October. Don't try to change the dates again because changing dates will put constraints. Rather, go to the project tab and go to the project information here and you can tell, uh, I know my project state start date to be say 2nd of September. So the moment you change the start date of the project here, it will automatically adjust the first activity in your project and the remaining activities will also get adjusted due to the dependencies we have set. So I will just say OK. Now you will be able to observe my project is starting on the revised date. You might miss the deadline because that's an older date here. So I'm just going to clear that deadline. Okay, so that it is much more readable for us. So I'm just going to set the baselining again so that it is more current with respect to this project plan. Okay. Yeah. Um, how can we have a different project plan? Uh, how, how can we differ project schedule against vendor and client? Okay. Uh, both could be mentioned in the plan. Okay. Uh, Santosh, can you please elaborate what your question is? Um, are you talking about do we need to have two versions of the same plan? One for vendor and one for the client? Is it something like that? Okay. Uh, remember, I would recommend don't have two versions of your same plan. Okay. But unless there is a strong requirement that you don't want to reveal it to others, I would suggest that have it separately. So you are trying to talk about uh, if, if, if you, if, let's say that if this activity is assigned to the vendor, whereas the remaining activities are assigned to the client. Okay, it's quite difficult to uh, share the same plan to both because you are revealing the other activities. So let's say that you have some resource names here. For example, I will say client, vendor, client, client, and uh, I'll just give some random names here. Just try to say, oops, sorry. Okay, so I've just entered some task uh, resource names for each of these activities, okay? So for example, instead of having two versions of plan, you might want to filter these activities. You can find, list all the activities related to the customer, okay? And uh, you can just say okay to it. So you, you, will, you will get a list of tasks here. So for example, if I want to send a quick uh, um, snapshot of this plan to the customer, uh, you might want to use this feature called, uh, sorry, you might want to use this feature called copy picture. Okay, so when you use a copy picture option, um, the benefit you have is you can also take a copy of the time scale that has been displayed on your right hand side. So I will say it is for screens, the rows on the screen here, I, I will say from 2nd of September till end of October. Okay, I will say I'll say okay to it. So what happens is uh, it is just takes a copy of the current image and I will just go back to my maybe my Excel and just paste it. So you're able to see we have a quick look at it. So you instead of having two different MPP files, I would recommend have the same one, try to filter it and circulate the data.
Okay, so I'll just remove this filter. Okay. Okay, the next question is, uh, sometimes it is not showing the critical path. Okay, uh, Pratap, you might want to check uh, whether all these tasks have been linked with each other. Okay, only then you would be able to know whether these tasks are linked to each other. Uh, can I insert a new project which is the most important and how? Okay, uh, I hope uh, your question was more about uh, taking, uh, can I insert a project? Okay, um, you are trying to talk about managing multiple projects. So, we will try to take that question at the end of this program, okay, when we do it. So, I am just going to take a quick recap. Uh, this is what we discussed. Um, Make sure that you have a WBS and follow this 1% to 10% rule. So when you say 1% to 10% rule, make sure that for each of the lowest level activities, the duration is at least 1% of the project duration and at most 10% of the project duration. For example, if it is a 3 months project, 1% is 0.5 days and maybe 10% should ideally be 5 days in this case. Okay, now let's take a small quiz. Okay, so participants, please use your Q&A to answer this question. So let's assume that you are preparing for your PMP exam. Okay, and you need to take this exam on October 1st. And you have having another activity called a studying activity. So between study and taking the exam, what dependency will you put? Will you link the finish to the start or to the start to the finish? Can you please go to your Q&A? and just give your response as option A or option B. I have given my requirement that you are taking a PMP exam and uh, this exam date has been finalized. Okay. Okay, good. So we have got a good set of response. Some of them have said A, some of them have said B. Remember, if you are an A person, which means if you have not prepared for the exam properly, you might reschedule your exam to a later date. That's what this means. Because the finish is driving the start of the next activity. Whereas if you are an option B person, which means you have already finalized the start date of your exam, which is November 1st, which means the start date of your exam is driving the finish date of your preparation, which means you will be uh, studying for the exam just the day before till the exam starts. So, so it all depends on the convenience. Okay, so I'm not trying to say which is correct here. So ask yourself which task is driving which task and accordingly try to set the dependencies. Now let's take the next one, uh, which is more in terms of how to record your actuals and how to keep your plan up to date. Okay, so there are a common mistakes what people make when they keep the plan up to date. The point number one is they keep the plan more static. They don't record actuals. They don't revise their estimates. The second problem is they enter a lot of dates. When they enter a lot of dates and start finish, it puts constraints. There are less dependencies on it. The third common mistake what I find is uh, uh, they will record actual progress but they don't learn from it. They don't learn the mistakes or the best practices and they don't revise their forecasted estimates in this case. So how do you avoid this problem? So the first step is you need to baseline your project plan. We have already talked about how to baseline it. So you just need to uh, go to the, uh, the project uh, set baseline option and make sure that you baseline your current project plan before you start recording your actuals. But once you have baseline your project plan, you might want to know what was the promises I gave to the customer. So I'll just go back to my project plan right now and let's say I'm baselining it again. I go to the project, set baseline, enter project, I'll say OK. So I have baselined it. Now if you want to know what is the target effort, what is the target start date and finish date, don't look at the table which you are seeing now. Remember your entry table represents your dates as on today. So this might be totally different from 
what you promise to the customer. So to look at the baseline data, go to the more tables and you have an option called baseline. When you say baseline, you can find your baseline duration. Okay, so this is that total effort you promised to the customer, the uh, baseline start and the baseline finish of these activities and the baseline effort of this complete project also. I would recommend if you are using Microsoft project, don't change these fields. The reason is if I revise my baseline duration from 3, 2 to 3, don't expect the other dates to change because what you are seeing right now is just a copy of your entry table. So in case if you want to revise your estimates, make sure you go to your entry table, add the new task, change the dependencies and baseline the plan once again. Now let's see how to keep your plan up to date. So there are two ways of keeping your plan up to date. So I'm going to more focus on how to keep your plan up to date by task level information. Okay. So the first uh, recommendation I would recommend is uh, if you want to say the task has completed as per your plan, go to your um, look at your Gantt chart. Okay, and I would like to say this activity has been completed. So one common mistake I've seen is people come to the start and finish column and they enter date. Remember, if you revise your start and finish, you are not recording actuals you are only revising your estimate or your forecast. If you want to record your actuals, make sure you change your tables to the tracking table here. So the tracking table is the one which is going to be used for recording your actuals. So you can find there are a few columns here called actual start, actual finish. So this has been left empty because this project is not yet started. So I will select the first activity here and I want to say this activity has been 100% complete. So I'll just say 100%. So you can observe the start finish is automatically set because it is based on your original estimates. And you can also observe your uh, percentage complete has been updated. Your remaining duration is zero. And you can also see your actual duration has been set to two days in this case. Okay. So, but here we are making an assumption that this particular activity ran as per the original plan. But it might happen that there are some activities that are running as per the plan, which might it might be completed or it might be incomplete or it might be in progress also. For which I would recommend make use of this option called mark on track. So I'll just go back to my project. Okay, and I'm just going to change it to days. Okay, so that you can understand it better. So now I'm going to assume that today's date is uh, 11th of September which means as on that date, you have collected the work done by your team members and you're going to record it. So I'll go to the project tab and you can find there is a status date option available. By default, the status date is today's date. So I'm going to change it to, let's say, um, 10th of September, okay? Don't expect any changes to happen on your screen because that is only a reference date. It would be better if we have some line referring that particular date. So I will go to the format and you can have an option called grid lines. Okay, so I'm just going to add a grid line here on that date. So you can find that this is the status date. On this date, I'm going to record my actuals. So let's take a, maybe an activity here, building prototype. So I want to tell Microsoft project that hey, this activity is in progress and it went as per my plan. Remember this task is neither 0% or 100%. It is somewhere in between. Now I can use this option called mark on track. When you say mark on track, it automatically looks at the status date and it updates the percentage completes and its actual and remaining duration. Another option which I would recommend is there might be certain activities in your project that might be maybe 50% complete, but the remaining work of that particular task can start only on or after the status date. So if you take the example of this activity, the remaining work and its successors can resume only on or after today, which means this task needs to be split into multiple pieces. So I will select that particular task and say, I'll go to the 
task, I will say move the incomplete part of that selected task on or after my status date. So you can observe it automatically moves on or after that particular status date. Okay. So similarly, if I want to say that an activity is taking longer or shorter or an activity is starting early or late, you can always change the remaining duration or you can always change the actual start or the actual finish of these activities. Now the question which all of you might have is, yes, we have recorded the actuals, but how do I compare the uh, baseline what we had with the plan what I have currently? So currently, if you look at it, we have seen three tables. The first table is what we have been working on is the entry table. The second table is called as the baseline table. The third table which we are talking about is a tracking table. Remember your entry table contains your forecast, which means the revised start date and your finish date based on the work you have completed so far. So if the customer is asking you, when will you complete your project based on your work you have completed and your revised estimate, you need to look at your level zero or your project completed milestone and say, this is when I'm going to complete my project. But if the customer is asking you, what is the um, approved start date and finish date of the project? Okay, so just look at my baseline table. So you can find my lo level zero tells you that I need to complete this project on this date and uh, maybe on this date. So you don't find any changes on my current project plan because my critical path is not getting affected. So let me try to uh, make a change in my critical path. Uh, let's say this activity needs another eight days more. So you can find my critical path has changed in this case. Okay. Since my critical path has changed, if I go to my entry table, you can find my revised finish date of the project. So if you want to compare my revised project plan with my target, look at your variance table because this will compare your current start with your baseline start, your current finish with your baseline finish and it will tell you by how many days are we delaying your current project. <coughs> okay. So before I move to the third pain area, okay, are there any questions on the last topic? Okay, Pratap Singh's question is, can we add more activities after setting the baseline? Pratap, you can certainly do it. You can add more activities, you can revise your estimates. But the question is, do you need to add these activities to the baseline or not? If it needs to be added to the baseline, it is assumed that they are approved by the customer. So you can add it even after baselining it. Okay. Um, okay, so Santosh says you mentioned client, PM, vendor in the resource name. These are not resources, uh, but level of monitors. Okay, remember I'm not talking about resources in this current topic, but um, the name what I've used there is just to give you an idea about if I have many people working in a project, okay, you can record resource information, okay. If we get a different chance, maybe I'll just try to uh, talk more about resources and how to optimize at a later point in time, okay. I think uh, this answers the question, okay, now let's proceed. The next pain area or the benefit which we need to look at when we are trying to prepare a dynamic plan is we need to use some graphical indicators to help you to understand what is the um, what is the level of progress we have made in the project. We might want to have uh, 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 maybe our own custom fields when it comes to building a project plan. So in Microsoft project, uh, there are something called custom fields, okay. Maybe uh, if, you are if you are preparing for your PMP exam, you might have heard about this term called activity attributes. So these activity attributes are mainly the different columns of your tables like task table, resource table and your assignments table. So apart from the standard columns given by the scheduling model, you might want to have some additional information for each activity, each resource and each assignment also. So in Microsoft project, there are different custom fields available. 
Remember when I say custom fields, it's not new fields you are adding to the MPP. They are existing fields like cost 1 to cost 10, text 1 to text 30, but these columns are not used by Microsoft project. You can rename these columns, you can write formulas on these columns and you can use it the way you want. So I might try to take a, a look at uh, some of these uh, um, uh, fields here and I'll show you how it can be customized. Maybe let me start with text 1. We all know text 1 can have only characters and alphabets. Okay, so I'm just going to go back. So let me uh, change my table to the entry table. Okay, so remember I am going to insert a column here which is a custom field. So I'll say insert column. I will type in text. So you will be able to find there are different text fields. So text 1 to text 30. It may not be ordered in the same way because it's more alphabetically ordered. So I'm going to say text 1. Let's assume that I want to have some kind of a lookup table. Okay, so you would like to say this activity is coming from uh, this business unit. Okay. It's not a resource allocation I'm trying to talk about. I need to map it to some department. One option is I can type the department name here. I can say department A, department uh, B. But remember there is a lot of typing which I need to do. And if I try to use a different name here, you cannot use it meaningfully for reporting. So what we can do is rather than typing in text here, we can right click and we can go for custom fields. So the first step is instead of having it as a text 1, I would like to rename that field. Remember renaming the field is not renaming the real field. It is just trying to have a, an alias for that field name. So I'm going to rename it. I'm going to say department. Okay. So I hope you can see the department is now displayed. And now I'm going to have a lookup for it. So you can have as many levels you want. For example, I would like to tell a project that uh, okay. okay, so I would like to have different levels here. Maybe let's say we have a finance and we have administration. Okay, let's say under finance. Okay, we are trying to have another activity here. Let's say I'm just going to talk about CEO finance. I'll just try to say project finance. Similarly for administration we will say facilities admin and the project admin. So I can try to select these two and I can push it. Oh, okay. okay, so you are having a set of values here and I'm just going to say okay to it. Now let me say okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me recreate it. Uh, it's a software issue from my end. Okay, so let me uh, look at whether I have this plan. Okay. And, uh, let's see if we have the tracking. Yeah, we have the data there. So I didn't lose much. So I'm just going to reinsert that column. Okay, I'm going to say text one. Right click. I'll go to the custom fields. I will rename that field to department. And I will just try to do a lookup. Maybe I'll just have three departments. Department one, department two, department three. Okay, I'll say close it. I'll say okay. Now you can find uh, the departments becomes more as a drop down. So you can select it. So the advantage is tomorrow you can try to apply the filter and see list of activities coming from a particular department or from other departments here. Okay, so participants are you clear with uh, the text one customization? Are there any questions on this?
okay sorry just get okay so let's take that uh, question here uh, mm, yeah okay C can you please explain once again how to mark the grid line okay i will i will do that uh, make now next question is uh, we can have two different schedules for the same project in respect to the client and other for the vendor uh, so how e every activity of project plan can collaborate with the project and compare it itself remember if you are having two different project plans um, uh, maybe i will if you if we have time we can talk about it we have something called compare projects here so you can have two different mpp files and you can compare the data of two different mpp files so i will try to pass this maybe at the end of this topic so that we can take it so maybe now your question was more about grid lines right so if i want to have a grid line let's say on september 9th the first step is make sure that you set a status date okay i hope on the project tab you can find it the second is go to format and you have an option called grid lines here grid lines grid lines so scroll down find the status date and have a pattern to it give a color to it if you want and say okay so the grid lines will be displayed okay yeah how to add an activity after setting a baseline so remember when after setting a baseline if you want to add an activity it is quite simple so remember you are when you say you are adding a new activity uh, it can be seen in two ways one is you are adding an unplanned activity or you are adding an activity that is approved by the customer whatever be the case make sure that the new activity what you are adding is added only to the entry table because your entry table is the one that is going to be very dynamic so let's say that after my project completion you need to do one more activity okay i'll just say one more task okay and this task is going to take 3 days and i'm going to set some dependencies to it i'll say lemon so for example if this task is not approved by the customer but this is something you are trying to add it here okay so naturally you don't need to do anything after this point because you have added it if you still want to meet the original timeline what has been given to the customer optimize the plan so that this task happens before the deadline but if this activity is approved by the customer select this particular task go to the project set set baseline and say it's only the selected activity needs to be baseline and the selected task if it is impacting the project timeline it needs to be rolled up to all the summary task i will say okay and i will say yes now if you look at your uh, baseline table you can find even for the last activity it has been baseline and uh, this change what you have added is impacting your project milestones also so i hope uh, this answers your query right okay fine so let's uh, move on the next uh, demonstration which i'm going to talk about is uh, mainly with respect to another custom fields where you can have some graphical indicators okay so i'm just going to go back to my variance table here we all know a variance table will give you with respect to the start current start and the baseline start whether you are ahead or behind so your positive value means that you are slipping maybe a negative value means you have started ahead of time let's make an assumption that uh, this particular activity uh, maybe the prepare started one day early okay so you can observe towards your right uh, this activity started one day early so if i go to the variance table you can find that task is starting one day early maybe the other activities are either starting on the same day or late you might want to have some kind of uh, an indicator okay uh, graphical indicators are quite useful because for the senior management or for the customer you need to report it so like adding a text field you can insert a column since we are trying to compare days i will say duration 1 duration 1 is a custom field so i'm going to right click i'll go to the custom fields here rather than doing a lookup i'm going to write a formula okay so the formula what i'm going to write is i'm going to compare my start 1 start with my baseline start so i'm just going to say
date okay I'm going to do a date div okay I'm going to compare two dates so this is a function available there so I'm going to say start needs to be compared with baseline start year okay and let me rename it let's say graphical indicators say okay to it I'll say okay now you might find it gives you the same value okay so I'm trying to compare it so maybe uh, the way in which I subtracted might be different but you are able to see the result here so if you have a one day year uh, we can assume that uh, it should be green if it is zero it should be orange if it is minus it should be red so I'll go back to the same custom fields and I'm going to say values to the display I can have a graphical indicators here I will say if it equals zero if it is greater than zero if it is less than zero so if it is zero maybe I'll say hello if it is greater than zero I might say red if it is less than zero I might say green okay I'll say OK to it. So now you can find some graphical indicators being displayed. So though uh, I have mixed the colors here, but you might know now that you can use graphical indicators and writing formulas for customizing this. Now let's uh, see if there are any questions. OK. So how do I assign cost to each one of them? Okay, so we will take that as the last one. So when you try to talk about cost, okay, remember uh, there are two ways by which you can have cost for each uh, of the activities. So I'll just go to that table called cost table. Currently, we don't have any cost in this current project, okay, because I have not I have not added any uh, task specific cost and I don't have any resources here, resource specific cost. Let's assume that for the first two activities, uh, there is a, a couple of resources which I need to add. So I'm just going to insert a column called resource names. Okay. So I'm just going to focus only on the client vendor. Okay, these two resources only. So I'll go to the, if I want to record some cost specific information, you can go to the resource sheet of your view. So I'm going to say the client, uh, the rate is uh, $1 per hour, vendor is $2 per hour. Which means for every one hour you're spending on the task, the dollar rate is this, for every one hour it is $2. Now if I go back to my Gantt chart, you can find the cost is getting calculated automatically. Maybe if you look at the effort he's spending on this particular task, you can try to relate it. 16 hours is 16 hours, whereas if you look at the vendor, since it is $2, so 76 into 2, it is 152. But if there are certain fixed cost you would like to have for each activity, maybe a travel cost or some uh, ad hoc cost you want to have for each task, you can go to the fixed cost and say, maybe the fixed cost for this is uh, 50, which means that that will get added to your total cost for this. Okay. Now you can see the cost is getting accumulated at an activity level. But if I want to see some kind of a workflow or a cash flow saying how the cost is getting added to your project, okay, um, there are a few reports which you might want to look at. So if we can go to the project. You have something called uh, a visual reports and reports here. So I'll just go to the visual reports to give you an idea about it. So I will select one report called a cash flow report. Okay, so I'll say cash flow, I will say in days, I'll say view. So if you look at this particular report, I look at the task usage. I will collapse it till days. 
so you will be able to see what is the cost okay so since you don't see much cost information for the bleeding days you don't do it but you can look at the chart here so this is how the cost is getting accumulated and this is how the cash flow is happening in your product okay let's see if there are any questions okay so we don't have much okay okay now let's quickly go back to my slides so we were just talking about uh, how to use the custom fields here okay so through which you can have a look up or you can have some graphical indicators now the last pain area which we are going to talk about is very specific to agile okay people who may not be following agile methodology may not be able to use the features what i'm going to demonstrate so just to give you a, a conceptual idea about what agile is agile ideally looks at adding value to the customer okay by giving them a workable product as quickly as possible where the customer is always given a freedom to change their requirements so the scope of the project is always going to change every day every week and every month so the project team as well as the customer are going to work as one single team in order to add value to themselves so there are a few terms which you guys need to understand when you are going to look at agile or scrum process so as you know that we have a customer who is having a set of requirements that he gives each of these requirements are generally called as a stories when it comes to scrum and the customer will ideally prioritize a list of stories okay and he will put it in what we call as a backlog here so from the backlog we are going to uh, select the best ones that can be completed in a sprint a sprint is nothing but like a phase or it is an iteration as per the scrum or agile process uh, each sprint should ideally be on a duration of 2 to 4 weeks so within 2 to 4 weeks we will take a set of stories from the backlog and we will give ownership of each story to each team member who can complete that particular work so at the end of each sprint okay it may not be that all the stories are completed any incomplete or unstarted stories will go back to the product backlog and it will be reprioritized and you go back to it. so it's more an iterative way of doing the project so we are going to look at how uh, we can use microsoft project for agile methodologies okay so these slides are available to you offline so you might want to run through it but i will give you a demonstration of how that can be done so i can close this current project okay so i'll just open a new project plan so we will start with a product backlog okay so i will say this is my backlog uh, so the product backlog is nothing but uh, a list of uh, items that needs to be completed in my project okay it does not mean all the things in my product backlog will be completed in next week it might happen next week uh, or next month or next year also so we use this term called stories right so let me say we have different stories let's say a story is nothing but not a task it's a requirement okay so i can say a requirement could be uh, login feature okay i will say report missing users i will say email customers and uh, we will say admin console so as you can see these each one is a different requirement okay they may be related they may not be but all of them are actually uh, a story so i am what i'm going to do is i need to tell that the backlog cannot start on a particular date so i'm just going to keep a future date here for example somewhere in december is when this backlog is going to do it so i've just changed it so the benefit you have is when you try to change the start and finish you can find your task mode is automatically manually scheduled because you have entered some dates for it for the leaf level activities i will make it as auto scheduled because i am going to enter some uh, duration for it when it comes to scrum or agile we use this word called the story points story points are nothing but uh, uh, a relative ranking which you have for each story in your uh, project so i'm just going to rename my duration column i'm going to change it to story points okay 
and uh, story points are not in terms of days okay so naturally I need to hide the days here so I'll go to the file I'll go to the options uh, maybe I will hide the days so you can find uh, in this option I'm going to say they should be as day and I'll say okay so typically in an agile project what happens is uh, let me save it first so typically in an agile project we use this term called story point so story point is nothing but a relative complexity of each requirement so generally they go for a voting process where people use a Fibonacci series for coming up with a story point so uh, uh, maybe the general values for story points will be 1, 2, 3, 2 plus 3, 5, 5 plus 3, 8 so that's how they ideally have a story point here so I'm just going to give some random story points here say let's say 1 day, 3 days, 2 days, maybe 5 days here okay so don't worry about these alerts because it's only a backlog now let's say the customer is telling you that there should be two sprints in this project so I'm going to say there is a September sprint and uh, I will say October sprint and the first sprint should be in two weeks and the next sprint should be in one week so this is something that is already agreed by the customer and he can't change this timeline so I will say this sprint should start in the first week of September and this sprint should start in the first week of October okay so remember I just created two task names now so now the customer might say that the, the login feature should be done in the first sprint. So I drag it and move it. Maybe the reporting should be done in the next sprint. So I'm just going to outline it. So I'm just going to push it to the right. Sorry. So let me try to zoom it so that you guys can observe what happens here so you can see during the month of September we have one sprint which has one feature so naturally when you try to drag let's say email customers to the September sprint you can find the dates automatically get adjusted because it is an auto scheduled activity that is the first point you need to remember the second point is it might be that uh, the story which you are trying to move from a backlog or from sprint to sprint for example this sprint uh, this uh, story is around uh, um, let's say it is around 10 story points okay now if I try to move this to the October sprint you will find you will be completing your email customer story only on 14th of October but as per the customer he has a deadline saying that it should be completed on 7th so now you need to negotiate with the customer and find whether the sprint's duration can be changed or whether it needs to be pushed back to the product backlog or not. Okay. So though Microsoft project is predominantly used for more for waterfall model or for projects where you are having a concrete scope, you can also use it for agile projects. It just requires some amount of customization like story points and you might want to use a task mode feature for it. So as I've already told you, right, you might want to look at the story points, uh, you might want to have some custom fields called sprint number that can help you to understand it. Okay. Now let me go back. Okay. So be, uh, before I conclude, uh, if you have any questions, uh, um, I request you to please uh, post those questions on your Q&A so that we can take it now. Okay, so this session is going is already recorded, so it should be available. So um, CII will send that information to you. So, 
just hold on I will just try to okay so I hope there were no questions uh, now okay now this is just for your information that uh, the Project Management Institute uh, PMI India is having their third national conference uh, in uh, New Delhi this year in September 27 and 28 in New Delhi so for more details I would request you to visit this URL so we are going to have a lot of best practices, uh, uh, industry experts who are going to talk about it. So we have uh, Sashi Tharoor, Ministry, uh, Minister of uh, um, Statistics. Uh, we have uh, Nandan Nilakeni um, of the UDDI and uh, we have Arun uh, Maestra from, who is the member of the Planning Commission also part of this. So there are a lot of keynote speakers, multiple tracks. So you might want to visit this one. So these are some of the photos uh, of the last conference that was been happening. So I would request you to make sure that you don't stop learning. Okay, so make sure that you start learning, collaborate with people and uh, talk to the experts, uh, whomever you are trying to approach to equip your knowledge. So if you have any questions, so this is my email address. Uh, you can always uh, feel free to get in touch with me on Microsoft Project or on scheduling. This is my contact number. So if you have any questions, you can also call me up on this point. Okay. So I think uh, uh, this is where we stand right now. And uh, thank you participants and uh, have a great uh, day and a great weekend also. Thank you Vikas, uh, thank you Uma.